got a little bit of excitement on the screen here because I'm projecting 600 by 400, which uh, uh, isn't what my laptop was planning to do, but somewhere in the connection it is doing that. So uh, I guess we'll do that and I'll try to keep things on the screen and if I push them off the screen, shout at me and we'll go back. Okay, so I'm Roger and a couple of days ago I told you the basics of Tor, which is uh, an anonymity system for TCP connections, web browsing, instant messaging, stuff like that. Uh, yesterday we did some Q&A on it, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how hidden services work in this sort of thing. So I'm going to give you an overview of Tor, how circuit building works in Tor, how hidden services work in Tor, and then I'm going to do a live demo on 600 by 400, which should be sort of exciting, and uh, then we'll cover up with some uh, questions about anonymity and uh, issues with hidden services in particular. Okay, so who needs this stuff? Uh, journalists, dissidents, whistleblowers, if you've got something you want to put on a website and not have other people be able to track down where the website is, then hidden services might be for you. So the idea of a hidden service is if you're running the Tor client, you can configure your local Tor client so that it can redirect incoming requests to some other TCP server, like a web server. So you can run an Apache server without a public IP address, and nobody who's accessing it can know where in the world it's running from. So that's the, the big picture here. Um, Censorship-resistant publishers, let's say you're an indie media publisher and you want to put your movie or story or whatever up, and you don't want bad guys showing up and walking away with your computer every so often, uh, maybe this would be a good replacement for that once we've got it working better. Um, people who don't have public IP addresses but want to have a web server, this is a fine use for that. Uh, corporations, I was talking to Google a while ago and they said, yeah, we're really interested in hidden services because we want to start launching new services like Gmail and Orkut and all these other ones without having people say, Google is beta testing the following service. So maybe you can do these sort of things and not have it publicly attached to your uh, IP address and host and so on. Governments are also interested in this. They want to have services that you can put up and that the bad guys can't send a bomber and blow up the city that the computer's running in because they don't know which city to send the bomber to. So there are a lot of different perspectives on this one also. How many people were here for either the Tor Talk uh, two days ago or the Tor Talk yesterday? Pretty much all of you. Okay, great. So you pretty much know how this sort of thing works. Um, we've got 250 servers around the world on five continents. We've got something like 50,000 users. It's an anonymity network, so I can't really tell for sure. Um, funded by the EFF and the United States Department of Defense, which is an interesting combination. I'm spending a lot of time trying to convince each of them that they should be cool with the fact that they both want security technology, and if they're both using the same network, then they're going to be getting more security than if they each had their separate network. Uh, so we're picked by the EU Prime Project as the best anonymity network that they could find uh, for their uh, anonymizing layer. And PC World likes us also. Okay, so how Tor circuit building works, I'm going to first show you how uh, you build the circuit forward, and then we're going to use that as a building block for the second one. So we've got Alice over here, she's the client, and she wants to make an anonymous connection to CNN or Google or something like that. So she's going to uh, download the Tor client and start it. It's going to pull down a list of the various servers she can use, and she's going to attach the first one and do a TLS handshake with it. So now she has a session key established with it, and once she's done with the circuit, once either, once either side throws away that key, n you can't look at the data that you logged and get anything out of it. So she does that, and then from there she tunnels to a second one. So now she's got a, a session key established with the first one, and then a second one with, an, uh, with the second one. And from there she tunnels to a third. So the nice property here is that no single server up there can link Alice to some website she goes to, to Bob. Um, the first guy, of course, knows that Alice is using Tor, and the last guy, of course, knows that somebody is going to CNN. But no single server up there can track everything that's going on and we can put multiple uh, TCP streams through a given circuit. So the tough part here, the expensive part, is establishing the circuit through the network, and then once you've done that, you can use that for 30 seconds or 10 minutes or whatever to get pretty quick transactions, because the, using the session keys is just symmetric cryptography, which is quite fast. So far, so good? Okay. So directory servers are a key point of this, and also hidden servers. 
uh, basically, where does Alice get the list of all the servers out there? She goes to a couple of servers which are special. Uh, their addresses and public keys are hard-coded in the Tor source. And uh, then she knows all the servers that she can use. Uh, so it would be nice to not need directory servers. Uh, they're a bottleneck in terms of trust, and they're also a bottleneck in terms of performance. Uh, but we need some sort of way for you to learn who's in the network without the bad guy telling you about his network instead. So that's an area of research, and you can ask about that later on. OK, so that was a summary of the past couple of days. Location hidden services. So before I was talking about Alice wants to get to CNN, and she's worried about somebody watching her wondering what website she's going to, and she's worried about somebody watching CNN or being CNN wondering who is connecting to them. So that was the threat we were talking about before. Now let's say Bob is going to, Bob CNN is going to run his website, his web service, but he wants to let people access it through Tor, but he doesn't want anybody to know its location. He doesn't want anybody to know its IP address or what ISP it has or what continents it's on and so on. So we want this to work for anybody who can get to the Tor network. If you can get to the Tor network, you can run one of these hidden services. You don't have to run a Tor server, just anybody who has any sort of outgoing connection to the internet. You don't need a public IP address. You can be behind a natted firewall. If you can use Tor, you can run a hidden service. Um, and we want it to uh, provide all these other nice properties. So how does this work? So we've got Bob over there. And he's going to pick a couple of Tor servers out there on the Tor network. Let's call them introduction points. And he's going to establish outgoing circuits to them in the way that I just described before. And he's going to hold those open. And at that point, he's going to go to some directory service. Right now, that's the same as the directory servers, but it doesn't have to be. And he's going to build a little service descriptor. He's going to say, this is my public key. These are the three introduction points that I picked. Uh, if you want to talk to me, this is how you can get to me. OK, so the easy way to do it from here is Alice should go to this directory service and pick one of the introduction points and connect. And then Bob would have onion routed out, Alice would have onion routed out, and then they can talk over that rendezvous connection. So that's easy to design, easy to build. The only problem is I talk to a bunch of cypherpunks, and nobody wants to run those introduction points. Nobody wants to run the places which publicly represent whatever this hidden service is and put out the data that this hidden service is providing. So the way we do it is we add another layer of indirection as true computer scientists. Um, so Alice is going to go fetch the uh, descriptor. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later how she fetches it. And she's going to pick a rendezvous point. She's going to pick some other random Tor server out there. She's going to onion route to it and hold that connection open. Then she's going to connect to one of the introduction points, also over Tor. And she's going to say, hi, I'm Alice. I want to talk to you. This is the rendezvous point that I picked. This is the rendezvous cookie you can use to say that it's actually you when you get there. Um, this is the first half of our encryption session key handshake. And if you want to talk to me, I'm waiting. And we could also add in more stuff like, and here's my super secret special authentication token, which says that I'm the Alice you really want to talk to. Many options there. So at this point, Bob can look at that and say, I'm too busy, buzz off. Or he can say, oh yeah, Alice, I want to rendezvous with Alice. I want to let Alice get to my web service. So he's going to onion route out to the rendezvous point that she picked. And then the rendezvous point is going to hook them together. So Bob is going to show up to that rendezvous point and say, uh, this is the rendezvous cookie that, I, that, that I'm planning to use. And here's the second half of my uh, encryption handshake. So the neat property here is that the rendezvous point doesn't know who Alice is, doesn't know who Bob is, and can't read any of the traffic that they're sending to each other. The introduction point doesn't know who Alice is, doesn't know who Bob is, and doesn't publish any of Bob's traffic. All the introduction point does is receive requests and hand them off to Bob, whoever Bob is. So the introduction points uh, can be run. They don't require much bandwidth or any latency or stuff like that. So they could run out of some small Caribbean island. And the rendezvous points could run in the middle of New York City. And you'd have a lot of bandwidth. And they've got no idea what they are transmitting. So that's the basic hidden service idea. And uh, I'm sure I can answer more questions about it later on if you've got some. OK, so in my 600 by 400 screen, 
Let me see if I can center everything enough to do that. OK, so first of all, um, a couple of you saw the Tor demo earlier. Uh, so this is Firefox. I'm going to try to center it. Here's the switch proxy plugin. So here I am um, going to Tor. Uh, I'm going go to go to Google here. And Google automatically said, oh, you're coming from the Netherlands, so I'm going to redirect you to google.nl. OK, so far so good. I'm going to turn Tor back on. And uh, we will load google.nl again. And then we'll load google.com, and we'll see which Google we get at this point. OK, so here we are coming in from probably somewhere in the US, because it didn't try to redirect us to the Netherlands. It said, oh, you're probably coming in from Arkansas or something. I'll give you the Google that uh, we think you should have. OK, so that's fine and good. But how did this hidden service thing work? So OK. I spent my prep time preparing to have 600 by 400. So you get to see a live demo as it actually happens and each step of it. OK, so there's a tutorial on the web if you want to set up your own hidden service. You can follow along right now with me, or you can go through the tutorial. Uh, it's pretty easy to find at tor.eff.org. So step zero, get Tor and Provoxy working. I've already done that. Uh, step one, configure an example hidden service. So before we do that, um, I'm going to go to the hidden wiki that uh, is set up as the example hidden service. So we'll see if this actually loads. So right now, I've clicked that address into my uh, Firefox. So Firefox hands the address to Provoxy, which is a web proxy running locally. And then that hands the address to Tor, which is the Tor client running locally. And Tor says, oh, that's sort of an unusual address. It ends in .onion. Uh, so I'm going to treat this specially. I'm going, I recognize this is a hidden service. So I'm going to do this whole rendezvous thing. So right now, here I've, I've brought up the hidden wiki. So this is a, a hidden service. You can see the address up there. Um, I don't know where it's running. I don't know who runs it. Uh, somebody, uh, so it's a wiki. So somebody uh, logged in just a little while ago. Uh, they're the people laughing over there. And uh, added some more things. You guys could log into the hidden wiki right now also. And who knows what it would show next time I, I reload the screen. But notice that it took a little while to do that. And the reason why it was doing that is because it was establishing all these extra circuits. And it was telling wherever the hidden wiki runs, hey, can you build your uh, new circuit over to this rendezvous point that I picked, and so on. So it, it takes maybe 10 or 30 seconds to load one of these. Um, but OK, so now you've got a basic idea of how hidden services work and how the name scheme works. So this thing right here is the hash of a shorter version of the public key of the hidden service. So what I have here is an authenticated connection to the hidden service, because I know for sure that I'm connecting to the guy who has the private key that corresponds to that uh, big hash string. So that's pretty nice, because you can it, this hidden service, this hidden wiki, could relocate from wherever, what country, whatever country it's in right now to some other country. And it would be exactly the same hidden service. And we'd have our own public key infrastructure, in a sense, that uh, allows me to know for sure that I'm getting to the right place every time. OK, so far so good. Um, now I'm going to set up uh, an example hidden service. And I'm going to walk you through each step. OK, so we're going to go to step two. Uh, OK, step one. So what you want to do first is you want to edit your, am I off the screen? I'm almost off the screen. There we go. Now I'm less off the screen. So you want to edit your Tor RC. And depending on where you've installed things, it could be in a variety of places. Um, We'll give you guys a little bit. So can you guys see that OK? Great. I figured out how to make my X term really large before this. OK, so in your Tor RC configuration file, there are a bunch of different things. I'll show you the top just to get you a sense of what's going on. Um, you can set up which SOX port you want to listen to, uh, policies for that, where your logs are set up, uh, directory servers you like. Um, and then we get to this section. This section is just for location hidden services. And I'm going to. Um, uncomment these two. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, please specify this directory for where you're going to store your hidden service stuff. And there are going to be two files that it creates there. And then this, 
line is when somebody asks for port 80, please redirect them to this IP and port. In this case, I'm redirecting them to google.com port 80. And I'm going to do that from whatever uh, this particular laptop thinks it is, because I'm going to run the hidden service from this laptop. OK, so far, so good. So I'm going to save that. And I'm going to restart Tor here. And uh, this is one output. Uh, you guys can't see the bottom very well, but so be it. So there's the bottom there. So I've restarted Tor. and. It has that Tor RC that I just had configured. So it's right now working on establishing all those introduction points and publishing th things and so on. So in uh, root hidden service, it just created this directory. And it created two files here. One of them is hostname. And you'll see that that's my brand new hidden service address. And the other one is private key, which is something that OpenSSL created, which is the key for this service. So you'll notice that. Uh, it automatically made the privileges so that uh, most people can't see these sorts of things. And when you're setting up your own, you want to make sure that you have right access, that your Tor client has right access to the directory that you pick. Um, okay, so we've got this host name. And uh, just for kicks, I'm going to move over to my Firefox and paste it in. And let's see, I'll move so that you can see the whole screen. Okay, so right now, my Tor client just got the request to go to this .onion address. So it is currently going to the directory servers and fetching the service descriptor that I was just talking about, and then doing the whole rendezvous thing. It turns out with itself, but it doesn't realize that it's rendezvousing with itself because it is serving a hidden service from this laptop, and somebody is asking for the hidden service from the laptop because it goes out through Tor before rendezvousing with itself. So here we have loaded Google. Notice that rew5-something-or-other.onion um, is the address that we went to. And notice that we get Google English. So depending on which uh, virtual host you ask for from Google, it gives you a different answer. If you ask for google.jp, then it will give you the Japanese Google. If you ask for rew5-something-or-other.onion, it says, oh, that's not on my list. I'm going to give you the default Google that, that says Google English down here. Because normally, when you go to google.com from the US, it doesn't have a little English word down there. OK, so that was so far so good on step one of the hidden service. And that was just to make sure that uh, we broke it up into steps. So if something went wrong, then we can figure out what's going on. OK, so step two is I'm going to set up a web server uh, running locally on this machine. Um, and I'm going to do a very simple one called uh, thttpd. And the nice thing about this is that it's really easy to build, really easy to configure. You're, wa you're watching me start from the tarball, ending up with a web server running as my hidden service. OK, so we've built the web server. I'm going to build a new uh, directory here. We've got an index file. And I'm going to, can't see what we're doing. OK. Um, so I built the index file here. And now I'm going to run the web server on port 5222, binding only to localhost. So far, so good? OK. So I did it. And uh, let's make sure we've got something running. Yes, we've got it running. All set. Um, OK, so now there's a web server running locally. Let's go back to this uh, Tor RC. Can you guys? Now you can see better. OK, so let's go back to this Tor RC. And rather than redirecting it to Google, let's, I'm going to redirect it to localhost 5222. And you can set up as many of these redirect lines as you want. Uh, for example, I can also redirect uh, port 22 to my MIT computer port 22. So this means that I could SSH into the hidden service. It would go through this laptop. And then it would get connected to SSH on my MIT computer. OK, so I'm going to set up that. And now port 80 is going to redirect, I hope, to the web server I just set up. OK, so I, I save the Tor RC. I go down here. I don't actually have to restart Tor every time. I could hop it. But for convenience's sake, I'm going to do this. OK, so we've got Tor running again. Now let's figure out where our, OK, so here. We're going to shift reload that thing. And it's 
going again to the Provoxy saying, hey, can you give me this web page? Provoxy is handing it to Tor, and Tor is saying, oh, that's a special .onion address. I'm going to have to go through the rendezvous thing with it. So at this point, uh, it is rendezvousing with itself. And uh, ooh, proxy timeout on somebody's, well, we'll ignore that. Um, OK, so what happened here, I assume? Yes, hidden service is unavailable. OK, well, here, here we have our live demo. So there are a couple of reasons why this could have happened. Um, one of them is that my network isn't working too well right now. Well, let me see if that's the case. No, it seems to be working fine. Another one is that it was just rebuilding the hidden service uh, descriptor, and it was putting a bunch of new um, uh, introduction points into that, and then publishing that to the directory server. And it could be that my Tor client uh, is pretty sure it's got an old one, and it's pretty happy with it because the timestamp's pretty new. So let's try again. This won't be quite as snazzy as the lock picking guy's demo, but on the other hand, you'll see an actual uh, Tor hidden service running once we've got it up. And it also, usually it's the case that uh, if you wait 10 minutes or something like that, it's a lot more likely to be robust and to have gotten set up. OK, so the reason why I'm binding to localhost right now, rather than just letting it bind to everything, is when you're running a hidden service in this sort of situation, you don't want people to be able to guess and check. You don't want everybody to be able to walk around and say, well, I see this hidden service. I wonder if that IP address is running exactly the same website as I can see on this hidden service. So by binding only to localhost, only the Tor client can get to it. So that's pretty straightforward. OK, here we are uh, failing to get to this hidden service. Well, we'll keep poking at it over the course of the uh, rest of the talk. And uh... oh, there we go. OK, everybody see that? And if we wanted to up here in the hidden service directory, we could have put all sorts of files. And we'll see if that one shows up. So notice here that, uh, oh, I want to go here. So once I've established the connection, it's usually pretty quick about being able to get to the next file and so on. So I actually cheated while I was doing my demo. There's a, a Tor option which specifies how often you rebuild your circuits. And while I do the Google demo to show, ooh, Google is in Polish and Finnish and whatever each time, um, I crank down that number really low, which means that it's going to change circuits all the time. Um, OK, so here we've loaded the other file that I just created. Uh, that's the, the foo file that I just made. So oop, you don't see. Now you see. There we go. So I can build as many different files as I want to in that directory. So there are people who've set up not just simple static web pages like this. There are people who've set up entire uh, content management systems a la Indie Media. And there are actually active web forum posting hidden services where people go and talk about uh, politics and whatever else they're uh, uh, thinking about that day. So OK, so far so good. Um, I've got a few more slides here, other things to talk about. OK, so we need to bind to localhost only. I talked about why we need to do that sort of thing. Um, so in the Windows world, it's a little bit trickier than just THTTPD. Um, that should work for Linux, BSD, OSX, uh, pretty much anything that can run an ordinary Unix program. Uh, but in the Windows land, you probably want to have some other web server. Probably the, if you're a Windows person, probably the best answer is just turn on your IIS. And I'm told that by default, the Windows firewall will block uh, people from outside from getting to that web server. So maybe that's an OK answer if you're a Windows person. Um, we also probably need to turn off virtual hosts and names and so on. All of these things are if you're going to be running Apache. Uh, so the reason why I picked THTTPD is it's, it's a trivial web server. There isn't really very much to it. It takes requests and it gives you answers. So it isn't going to, for instance, uh, answer questions about what your uname of your computer is or please give me the uh, exact version of your Apache and the exact version of every module which you've installed in your Apache. Um, or your server status things. So one of the interesting things, uh, particularly about Apache, is that it's configured by default to answer server status questions only from localhost. It figures that's safe. 
But the funny thing here is that my Tor client, my, my hidden service, is running on localhost. So it is totally trusted by all the applications. We found this initially when we had uh, a default exit policy for all the Tor servers that was very open. We allowed port 25 and many other ones. And everybody said, yeah, my, my send mail is locked down just fine. I don't mind having port 25 in my exit policy. But then people exit from their Tor exit node to their send mail. They're coming from localhost, so they look just like an ordinary trusted user. So one of the tricky things here is that you've tunneled past all the firewalls and NATs and anything else that you might have protecting your computer, and your hidden service can get to whatever you configure it to um, like that. So you want to make sure that if your web server comes with default things saying all the guys from localhost are totally trusted, but the outside is scary, um, in this case, you're going to be tunneling people from the outside into localhost, so you want to turn that sort of thing off. And also PHP. Um, and be careful if you're running an Apache and you want to set up another virtual host for your hidden service, maybe people can connect to the hidden service and then ask for your public website and verify that that's what they're getting. Or connect to the public website and ask for the .onion address. So far, so good? OK. Um, Non-anonymity uses. So I've been talking about anonymity so far, uh, but there are some other approaches here. One of them is if, what happens if you want to run a service without an IP address? What happens if you are sitting down the hall from corporate finance, and boy, are they not going to let, let TCP connections come into the corporate LAN at that point? If you can get to the Tor network, you can run a Tor hidden service. So anybody who isn't given privileges by their cable modem company to run servers, this is one way to do it. Um, and another fun part of it is that they're authenticated, which means that you could put your hidden service private key on a little USB key, and you could walk around and plug it in, and wham, you'd have your authenticated, encrypted, hidden website uh, being served from what the hack or wherever else you happen to be. So there are many different ways of doing this. Um, one of the nice things we've been thinking about is setting up a hidden service that, is connect, it, that, that lives on the same computer or next to on the LAN, an indie media server or a big blogging site or something like that. And this means that if people are using Tor to get there, they can know for sure that they're getting to the right place because they've got this uh, .onion address, which is self-authenticating. So you get end-to-end -end encryption because you're using the Tor network all the way to the last top, which is right next to the web server. And you get end-to-end -end authentication because you're using the Tor network and the hidden service address and so on without having to do anything weird with your Firefox. So you just interact with the web like normal. And you can get a lot more assurance that the website you're connecting to is, in fact, the one that people mean you to be connecting to. OK, um, people have been running hidden service IRC servers. Uh, there are a couple of entire IRC networks which are just hidden services. And people go there, and they use Tor to get there. And I guess they talk about whatever it is people talk about on IRC when they're anonymous. Um, there's an OFTC gateway that uh, Weasel set up so that you can go um, through Tor hidden services to the OFTC IRC network. And this means that you get end-to-end -end encryption and end-to-end -end authentication, assuming you trust the guy who set up the hidden service. And he's over there and looks kind of trustworthy to me. Uh, so another approach would be a decentralized Jabber server, where every user runs their own Jabber server and sets up their own hidden service for it. And that means that there is no central place where the instant messaging happens, and everybody can speak to everybody else, but nobody knows where anybody is located right now. And nobody can figure out, uh, just from their client, where each other user is located. So that's maybe another way to do instant messaging that doesn't have as many centralized bottlenecks or ways of tracking other people down uh, as some current systems do. And a lot of people just use Tor for forward instant messaging. They use Tor to get to their AOL instant messenger account. And that means that AOL doesn't know their location right now, which is maybe a security uh, property that they're looking for. OK, so other things to think about. Uh, when I first started out with this, my example uh, Tor RC lines uh, told you to put your hidden service in slash temp. 
And the reason for that is that everybody was able to write into slash temp. So it worked really easily when people were playing with it. The problem is if you wait a little while, your hidden service gets removed uh, along with your private key. So as soon as that private key is gone, that hidden service is dead forever because you're never going to create another private key that matches the first one. So if you have a hidden service that a lot of people are using all the time, you might want to back up your private key somewhere. OK, so those are the easy ones. Now the anonymity issues. If you run a hidden service on a dial-up, and people can get to it sometimes and not other times, for example, you turn your computer off at night, then they might be able to figure out uh, what time zone you're in because you turn your computer off all, all the time at 6 p.m. and you turn it on again at 9 a.m. So if your computer is not on all the time, you're leaking information to somebody about where in the world you are, or if they've got suspicions about whether it's you running it, and they ping you, and your hidden service is available, and they ping you and you're not there and it's unavailable, they can start to get pretty confident that you're the guy offering the service. So, OK, so that's also maybe an easy anonymity problem. The trickier one, so the threat model for the Tor network for forward anonymity is if the adversary can see both sides, if he's able to observe Alice and he's able to observe Bob, CNN, the website, um, then he can look at the traffic on both sides and do statistical attacks to decide that, yes, in fact, this squiggle matches up with this squiggle, so I'm pretty sure Alice is talking to Bob. That's the threat model there. The adversary has to be on both sides. So in the hidden service case, when you're attacking a hidden service, the threat model is still the same, but the adversary already starts out on one side because he can be the guy requesting the, the hidden service. He can be Alice showing up and saying, hey, how about you rendezvous with me? So he's already got half of the equation solved. So all he has to do is maybe run two or three Tor servers and eventually when he makes a request to the hidden service, he will see his Tor server sending a little notice to Bob. And then he'll say, aha, I have found the hidden service. So the first answer is you should run your hidden service on a Tor server because that way he will see the request going to another Tor server and it won't as obviously be convincing that, aha, I have found the hidden service. So that works the first time, but there are statistical attacks on that as well. It's called the predecessor attack, where you do this a whole lot of times, and you keep track of every time it goes through your server, you keep track of which server was next. And over time, it's going to be a particular server that's always next, or that is more often than not next. So that attack, so running your hidden service on your Tor server doesn't totally solve the problem, but it does probably slow down the attack. One of the counterintuitive problems with that attack is that the more servers there are in the network, the more Tor servers we have, the more unusual it is that your server was next twice in a row or something like that. So the bigger the Tor network gets, the faster the attack works if you run some of the Tor servers and you're trying to identify where the hidden service is. And that's an unhappy uh, property of anonymity as we understand it right now. Um, hopefully in a couple of years I'll give a talk and explain how we beat that problem. But I'm not very optimistic about it right now. OK. Um, so there are a couple of other issues. One of them is. Uh, the same thing I was talking about before, if the adversary is requesting the hidden service, he can cause traffic to arrive at Bob. Um, we have this a little bit solved. He can't cause an arbitrary amount of traffic to arrive. He can only cause the, the one cell, hey, there's this person and she wants to talk to you. So it's only 512 bytes that you can induce going to Bob. But you can induce it again and again. So maybe you can produce a lot there. Uh, so we've got a little bit of a protection because in the original design where Bob just picks an introduction point and Alice connects to it and they talk, Alice could immediately start dumping as much data as she wanted onto Bob and see if she notices any blips anywhere else in the network. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time left. I'd be happy to answer questions and uh, maybe we'll also click on some of the hidden service things and see which ones are available and which ones aren't. Um, So there are mics around. There's one up here, I believe. If anybody has any questions about uh, how hidden services work, or Tor, or politics, or whatever else, um, go for uh, it. Is there any way of um, hosting the same website twice? So um, in the spe specific case of web servers, 
Um, I want somebody to be able to go to fingerprint dot uh, onion, and it, sometimes it will go over here, and sometimes it will go over here. Will that slow down the statistical attack as well? Okay, so there are two answers to that. Um, one possible answer is, let's imagine you have a public website, which everybody can get to normally, but you've got a hidden service mirror of it, and you tell people about both the hidden service name and the public website, and most people can mostly get to the public one all the time until somebody knocks it over or steals it or whatever, and then people would start getting to the second one. But that's not what you were asking, I think. You were asking, can I run two hidden services which are the same name, and then we would round robin or load balance or something. Yeah, almost lo load balancing over DNS as you would normally do after a um, pop server or something. I don't have a design for that yet, uh, but it would be really handy to have that as an immediate backup because one of the fine attacks against hidden services is you guess what computer is running it and you knock it over. And if the hidden service goes away, then you were right. Do you think it would slow down some of the statistical attacks that you were mentioning earlier, like the first one and the second one as well? It might. Um, but if you only have two and there are hundreds and hundreds of Tor servers, then we would quickly narrow in on one or both. But the and widening if, of the time should be linear in the number of boxes that you've got. It depends what you're worried about. If you're worried about any of them being found, as in finding this box would link it to you, then you don't want to have a whole lot. You just want to put all your eggs in one basket and hope that nobody finds it. So but, I'll, um, I'll take that into consideration. <laughs> okay. okay cool. Talk to me more afterwards if cool. you want well, we'll more uh, detailed then. advice. Um, if you run a Tor server um, uh, and you run a hidden server, an attacker will s be able to see there's a connection going into your Tor server, but it's no connection going out. So it must be a hidden server on that server, right? Yes. So you cannot hide at least that fact. Nobody will know what kind of hidden server you're running, but the fact that you're running some kind of hidden server will be obvious. Not necessarily. The fact that you are passing Tor traffic around will be obvious. But there could be lots of reasons why traffic comes into you and stops. For example, you're pulling down a directory or you're pulling down a hidden service descriptor. Um, but once the adversary has surrounded you, you're not doing too well. Once the adversary is able to see all the traffic coming into you and all the traffic coming out of you, and he suspects that you run a hidden service, he should watch all of your traffic and then ask you to rendezvous with him. And then a little request will come in and you'll build a circuit and then he'll be talking to you. And at that point, you could stream audio over it to him and the audio would come out over here and it would show up over here and you'd say, aha, I've got you. So hidden services are not as strong as I'd like them to be. And the main reason for that is that Tor is not as strong as I'd like it to be because it's for low latency connections. Uh, practical to build, usable, anonymous, pick two. And there are a number of different systems out there that have picked different trade-offs here. But if you want to have users able to browse the web very quickly uh, without getting frustrated and leaving, then you're going to have to be fast enough that these end-to-end -end attacks work. And that makes me sad, but it appears to be the current state of things. So if you, if you can defeat the end-to-end -end attacks because your adversary is small, or because your Tor network is huge, or because your computer runs in East Venezuela, then maybe you're in better shape. So wouldn't the obvious solution to your Apache problem be to add a second IP address to the loopback interface that is not 127.001? and simply use that one. Sure, you could. Um, that requires actually knowing how to add another loopback address and so on, which most users I don't expect to know. Uh, I, the easier thing to do is to be aware of what applications are running on your computer and be aware of what they trust to do what and try to have very few. Now, I understand that you'd like to minimize the number of sessions that you have um, but if you have multiple ones and you do some sort of, not exactly load balancing, but some statistical stuff between that, would that help? So in other words, that you now no longer have one circuit that traffic is coming into, mm -hmm. but you have multiple ones. The short answer is I don't know. But I'm pretty sure it wouldn't help 
uh, let, me give you, let me give you an example. Um, Alice is trying to go to CNN, and she's worried that somebody out there is going to learn that Alice reads CNN. So scenario one, she builds one circuit, and she makes her request and gets it. If the adversary was at the beginning and the end of that circuit, then he says, aha, Alice and CNN. Scenario two, she builds five circuits, and she spreads her request over all five of them. So maybe she sends a little bit out, and then the web page comes back on all five. Because it's low latency, because it's fast, if the adversary is at the beginning of end, end, end of any of those five, he says, aha, Alice and CNN. So there are some other designs out there that try to smear things over a lot of circuits. And if they try to be fast, I'm pretty sure they're vulnerable to this. So practical, usable, anonymous, pick two. Other questions? OK, well, we've got, are we out of time, or do we have a few uh, more minutes? Can I have a Ooh. question? What? Yeah. Um, a question about the directory uh, service. Yes. Isn't that quite vulnerable? Because that's where actually logging can be done of uh, services uh, people provide, of web pages, isn't it? So the, the directory servers are a point of centralization, yeah. and that is a big problem. It's not, so there, I've got two answers for you. Uh, one answer is when my laptop as Alice was going to the directory server to fetch the hidden service descriptor, it went through Tor. Yeah. So the directory server didn't know who was asking. And when my laptop as Bob was going to the directory server to publish his hidden service descriptor, it also went through Tor. So, that got, so the, the directory servers didn't know where Bob was. But the directory server does know the existence of each hidden service, and he is able to censor hidden services. He says, blah, 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 dot onion, I don't like that one. You can't publish that. Um, so that's a, that's a definite point of vulnerability. But the second point is all I need is key value lookup. I need somebody to say, this key has this value, and somebody else to say, what value does this key have? So there are a lot of different decentralized data structures, like distributed hash tables and other ones, which we could implement here instead of using the directory servers. So using the directory servers is just a, a convenient step at this point until somebody builds something that can spread over 10,000 computers and mirror and replicate and be efficient and so on. Does that answer that? Yeah, it's a, but it, it would be better to spread it out. I agree. I, I look forward to seeing your design and implementation of a distributed hash table. If you want to help out, we, we definitely need help at all levels. Uh, Tor.eff.org, there's a volunteer page if you want to do documentation, translation, coding, uh, breaking our documentation. You guys should all set up hidden services and put your favorite uh, subversive files on them. And uh, that way we'll test out if these things actually work. So thank you. I'll be around for questions. Testing. If anybody's driving to Amsterdam this evening and have two spaces and wants to learn all about anonymity, let me know. <laughs>